I'm right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We'll get a quick start. Uh, welcome to Harborview. I hope you're enjoying your snacks. And for the rest of you that are not here and not at Harborview and watching anyway, it is my pleasure. We have a little. We have a treat here to uh, have Dr. Stephen Hamilton, who will be talking to us about five new things in ophthalmology, which uh, should prove quite exciting. This is part of a series that Dr. Craigfield has uh, begun this year, and uh, so. Uh, we have this seminar, and then next week, I believe, we have the uh, fabulous Dr. Bruce Ransom, who will be giving us five new things in neuroscience. So, with uh, that, thank you, Dr. Hamilton. All right, I've got a mic on. Oh, okay, so Claire asked me to come up with a new talk, which I did. So, five things that are relatively new in neuroophthalmology or new developments mm -hmm. for five different topics, which was kind of a fun challenge for me. And Dr. May and I talked, well, what are the five most interesting things we could talk about? So we had fun narrowing it down. But this is what I chose, and some of it's newer than others, and I thought you might not have kept up with the literature on some of this, but photophobia, which every neurologist is going to see for sure, giant cell arteritis. I'm going to talk a little bit about what used to be called pseudotumor cerebri, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. OCT in neurology, in particular with regards to multiple sclerosis uh, care, and NMO, or neuromyelitis optica. So let's talk about light sensitivity. So I know, because I was a resident in the program here, that this is a very common problem, and we see it in our migraine patients, we see it in people with leprospasm, and traumatic brain injury, and there are quite a few other disorders. And I don't know exactly, it's fascinating to think about why these subgroups have light, such, some of them have totally disabling light sensitivity. It's very interesting, I think. Uh, I've seen the full gamut of patients who come in with, you know, these hats and, and dark, dark goggles and no exposure to light. Sometimes it's so intense. And they often get thought to be psychiatric cases because they're so disabled by light. And we really didn't have any scientific basis to understand the patient's subjective complaints until more recently. But there's been a huge explosion of literature about the, in, in science, uh, journal science, about the physiologic basis for photophobia or photosensitivity. And most of these folks have a normal exam. They may have a mild dry eye or blepharospasm. I think it's a very good trigger for blepharospasm. So um, they often come into the examination room wearing dark glasses, as you can imagine. So this is the circuit that has been uh, established. And my colleague, Kathleen Degree, at, at the University of Utah and Brad Katz have really done quite a bit of work on reviewing this in terms of the neurological aspects of it. Um, but this is uh, the pathways that have been proposed are this, that in the retina, we have the traditional retinal ganglion cells that are connected to rods and cones, the RGCs. But there are separate photoreceptors that are not rods or cones that are called intrinsic photosensitive uh, retinal ganglion cells, IPRGCs. And these things uh, have been described and found in terms of uh, actual testing of pathological specimens. You can define these and do staining for them. And you can show that they have separate projections primarily to the thalamus. And then from there, it's thought that there's thalamocortical projections for pain. And there are also reciprocal pathways with a trigeminal nerve and nucleus. So uh, therefore, you get other involved symptoms from trigeminal nerves. And these, this explains how patients who are blind perhaps from birth, that it, or wiped out their rods and cones with uh, retinitis pigmentosa, for instance, uh, prefer sunglasses. And you ever wonder why these patients don't like light exposure if they're blind? Why do they have to wear sunglasses? Are they just hiding their eyes from not being able to see cosmetically? No, they're light sensitive. And they're light sensitive because these cells are overactive and they project a pain pathways. This is the, the mechanism that is proposed to explain photophobia in these patients. So therefore, even before this was known, uh, folks had discovered that there is a possibility of blocking certain wavelength of light, typically the blue wavelength spectrum, which is around 500 nan nanometers, 
that will uh, subjectively patients will be much improved in terms of their light sensitivity. And this shows the spectrum how the blockage of FL41, which is really a tinting that can be applied to any lens, any, any, any common lens, and how at, at this particular wavelength, it's blocked from getting through uh, versus regular sunglasses, which are gray lenses. You see a, a diminution of the transmission of wavelength in this blue white uh, wavelength in Egypt. And it's quite effective. I've been using FL41 for 15 years or so. I didn't understand really why it worked. Uh, I knew that it, this was proposed that it blocked blue wavelength light. But it turns out the IPRGCs are most uh, sensitive. They're most activated by blue wavelength light. They selectively respond to blue wavelength light. So by uh, if you will, dampening the transmission of blue wavelength Light, patients are much more comfortable with, uh, with the light sensitivity issue. So, uh, do any of you know about FL41? Do you prescribe it for your patients here? Have you been using it? Because I get referred a lot of patients with light sensitivity from eye care providers who find no physiologic basis for it. And uh, sometimes other patients, particularly traumatic brain injury patients, are almost virtually always light sensitive. This is the one thing that I can do that is actually quite appreciated. Uh, I've tried using uh, nortriptyline and tricyclics and other medications. Gabapentin doesn't really help light sensitivity unless it's a, truly a migraine phenomenon with migraine aura. And these patients are light sensitive all the time. Obviously worse if they're having a headache or migraine, uh, but they, are, they have a constant light. So I think it's a big breakthrough, and it's pretty fascinating. They've done randomized trials, blinded trials, between regular sunglasses and FL41, and shown that patients uniformly prefer FL41. It, it's a proprietary thing, but it can be obtained locally. Uh, so there is a place uh, out in the north end in Bothell, Woodlawn Optical, that does it for our patients. Other, other uh, opticians can also get the FL41 and apply it to existing lenses. It can be done while the patient waits. Um, Brad Katz, who's at the University of Utah, has actually formed a company where he's making high-grade FL41 lenses, which is not uh, an application of a, fil a filter, a liquid filter, like a film, but it's ground into the glass, and he finds that it has a higher ability to block blue rays like light. He's done some clinical tests with that that it may be superior to the typical applied coating. So it can be put on in any density. You can make it very light. I have patients who get some for indoor use and a separate pair of wraparounds, very dense for driving purposes. Very helpful for blepharospasm patients, especially if you see traumatic brain injury patients. I would keep it in mind. And if you don't know how to get it, you can always contact me, and I'll, I'll help you find it. Uh, just a little reminder about these folks. You know, they do doctor shop, and they're so grateful if there's actually a true physiologic explanation why they might have this horrible light sensitivity. They're quite grateful. And uh, if you, it's probably not a good idea to wear dark, dark sunglasses indoors because then the, the retina becomes very uh, photosensitive to exposure uh, because of the lack of light in so I encourage patients, they can wear the FL41 inside, but not regular sunglasses. And I always try to explain this pathway in layman's terms so they have some understanding about what is the physiologic basis for their compliance. Yes? Wouldn't it also be true that the sunglasses wear in the patient Yes. Yes. Right. And then if they go into a brighter environment, they're going to bleach the retina and it can be quite uncomfortable, you know, going from one environment to another, especially. Yes? Yeah, they're tied in. Yes, exactly. They have projections, which I might not have pointed out there, to uh, the superchiasmatic Nucleus it is involved in, in light in terms of biological rhythm. Circadian rhythms. They have another pathway that projects to circadian rhythm rhythm centers. Plus so, and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So they have some interesting different 
pathways, but the pain pathway is thought to be primarily via the thalamus. Yeah, I think it's very fascinating. I think it's very, it's very interesting. And so this story is evolving. And uh, the folks at University of Utah are really sort of pioneering the clinical application of this. They're doing Kathleen Degree is a headache expert, and she's quite bright, and she's she really knows quite a bit about this. Okay, so the next one, this uh, is just something I really want for the residents to really be tuned into. This is a patient I just saw literally about a month ago. 64-year-old patient seen by me a few years ago for double vision from Parkinson's disease. And I see people for Parkinson's all the time. They get an exophoria, they have convergence insufficiency, put them in some, you know, prisms, some basin prisms, and they're kind of good to go. And I helped him out with that and, and let him go. And so he, I got called um, on a Friday, and the patient had had a transient loss of a vision in one eye for 10 minutes. It was late Friday, and so it's like trying to figure out what do we do with him. He's over on Vashon, really nice guy. So I said, okay, go, you need to go to the emergency room. Swedish would be preferable, or you know, somewhere in Seattle. <laughs> so he followed my advice, and he went to the ER, and you know, I, I expected him probably to get uh, some things done. Uh, you know, transient monocular blindness, he might get a Doppler done, he might get some blood work done, you know, I was hoping that, and he calls me the next day, not only does he call me the next day, but a, a friend of mine who's a socialite says, you need to see my friend, you know, he needs to see you right away. She didn't know that I'd seen him six years previously, and I'd already known about this, and I said, oh, I, well, I actually know about him, and I told him to go to the emergency room, and I need to find out what they did, you know, and so... I said, come see me now, you know, because it turns out he said, well, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. They told him he had an optical migraine, and they sent him home. And he said they didn't do any blood work. They didn't do a Doppler. They didn't do a scan. You know, they did nothing except uh, they, they called an ophthalmologist or someone who said they thought it was an optical migraine, you know, 10 minutes of monocular blindness. So uh, I had him come over and immediately get a carotid Doppler which showed uh, non-significant stenosis, and I sent him for a SED rate and a CRP, and the SED rate you can see there, and the CRP was 96, it was extremely elevated. So what do you do now? What would you do? Steroids? IV steroids? He hasn't lost vision permanently. Well, you do something, right? Okay, you need a temporary biopsy. So you think he has giant cell arteritis, likely. 64. Yeah, there's a very good chance. What if you do nothing? What's going to happen? Might, what is the odds that he's going to go blind in at least one eye, do you think? Is it more than 50%? I would say yes. Uh, this is the second patient that I've had in not too long a time that I've saved from going blind in, in either eye, which is quite unusual. Usually we see them after the first eye goes blind, and unfortunately after the second eye when it's way too late to do anything. It happens way too frequently. So I, I sent him to start 80 milligrams of prednisone a day. Um, I didn't give him IV stories because he hadn't actually lost vision at this point. He didn't have evolving visual loss, so you could argue that you might give him steroids. But I was a little worried about his Parkinson's and all of his medications and IV steroids. And I arranged for a biopsy through his primary care doctor. And this is what happens. You know, the biopsy, you know, the primary care doctor says, well, it's equivocal. You know, they read it as equivocal. So I said, well, what does that mean? I get the biopsy report. Well, it's showing focal chronic inflammation in the, in the artery. You know, that doesn't seem terribly equivocal to me. But no active granulomas. So I asked my friend to, to sort of look at this and look into it, and, and often I have them redone. I have them recut if, if I really think it's giant cell, and, and I don't agree with the, the interpretation of the biopsy, or we biopsy the other side if we've only done one side. So my, this was re-examined by my colleague, and he said it's definitely consistent with GCA, um, no question. So the patient did fine, he did not go blind, and is still on prednisone now and getting a taper. 
So this is GCA, and, and the worst complication other than death, I think, or, or myocardial infarction is blindness, because it, it's quite common with it. And it happens even with patients treated with steroids. And uh, uh, my colleague gave a lovely lecture about this, and she really emphasized that this is an emergency. You know, this is, a, this is something you can't just sit around on and just blithely ad admit people to the hospital, let them sit in the emergency room for hours, you know, to get to a floor. If somebody presents with ischemic optic neuropathy that's arteritic. Because, and if you miss the diagnosis, the likelihood of the other eye going blind within days to weeks was over 50%. It's a very high likelihood. Uh, so, and I think you should also consider double vision in people over 50. You should be thinking about giant cell arteritis. I diagnosed it myself in an ophthalmologist colleague who was operating, having intermittent double vision. He came to see me, and I started talking to him and saying, you know, we have any other symptoms? Well, I'm kind of achy, flu, I feel like my muscles. You, know, you talk to him more, you get more and more symptoms that sound suspicious, you get this sed rate CRP and it's high and he has giant cell arteritis. So uh, even in an ophthalmologist you'd think would recognize it in themselves, but not necessarily. So I showed you an earlier case from the residents were here of ischemic optic neuropathy with this chalky pale disc that's typical of uh, GCA. And if you see re any retinal ischemia in those cases, it's pathognomonic for an arteritic process. So that's very helpful if you see uh, retinal ischemia with a swollen disc. I always feel the temporal arteries in these patients. So you really want to sort of feel the pulses, see if they're tender yourself. You should always do that if you're thinking about it before you know the sed rate and CRP. And I never send one without the other. So I always send both because I've had many cases with fairly normal sed rate and elevated CRP. If the CRP is high, I'm often inclined to biopsy if the clinical presentation is suspicious, even with a normal sed rate. And of course, consider, like I said, doing the other side. If the biopsy comes back negative, depending upon where the biopsy is read, I, I will get the slides or the, the original material and have it recut. You know, they, they say they do multiple cuts, but then you get the specimens and you find out they really didn't do very many. And there's skip lesions. Yes? Yes, if it's a very, yes, and I've done that many times. If I really feel like this is very strong likelihood and I, the biopsy is not in agreement, I might continue steroids with a slow taper. So, I mean, you still have to go with your clinical impression overall. Um, I don't routinely order bilateral biopsies, but like Mayo Clinic often does. They do, they do both at once. I, I, as a fellow, I did biopsies when I was a fellow, and they're not easy. In older patients, finding the temporal artery can be challenging. And I've had them come back from my own colleagues who are plastic surgeons, and it says no vessel was identified, nerve. You know, they, they actually sent a piece of the nerve rather than the artery for, for examination. Who do you usually choose to do the biopsy? Well, that's a good question. So no one wants to do them. This is the other thing. The ophthalmologists used to do them all the time, either general ophthalmologists or plastic orbital surgeons. And they will reluctantly. They get reimbursed so poorly and it interferes with their productivity, they don't want to do them. So now I send them to the vascular surgeons because frankly I think they're obligated to do it. I mean, if you can't send a biopsy to a vascular person, who can you send it to? So they don't usually complain and they do a good job. They know they need to get, you know, two centimeters if possible and I, I've generally had very good luck with the vascular surgeons. Uh, working the patient, if you talk to them, they'll work them in. You don't need to do it immediately as long as it's done even within two weeks. If it's a good pathologist and they know the patient has been on prednisone or received IV steroids when they're interpreting it, they can still make the diagnosis. But it depends a lot on the skill of the pathologist, uh, which is highly variable. So Valerie's uh, lecture, what I remember from the lecture, she said, hit hard, hit fast. That means if the patient's in the middle of evolving visual loss and, and, and blind in one eye, now she advises IV methylprednisolone a gram a day for three days. Get it as fast, and not only that, but you know, it needs to be given as quickly as possible. So if I were to put a patient in the hospital who's 80, who's blind, 
you know, you don't let them sit down there and admitting for four hours, and then the, the IV steroids arrive on the floor uh, eight hours later, especially if it's one eye. It's gonna, it, they may go blind in the other eye. You, you call and you facilitate getting it done as quickly as possible. And that really takes the physician effort to get that done uh, quickly. Um, put them on aspirin. There's no role really for heparin. And then we do, we substitute prednisone, we do a slow taper. I might, if we can't use IV steroids, I would use for visual loss 80 to 100 of prednisone typically, not 40 to 60, which rheumatology uses for headaches and other symptoms of GCA. And for the people that we can't get off of steroids, then we substitute drugs like methotrexate. So, I just think you need to be really aggressive, and if you're really a good clinician, you know, like these cases, you can catch them before they've gone blind. And it's just so satisfying to, to be able to catch someone and, and save their vision when you know they would be blind in one eye otherwise if they hadn't been diagnosed. Yes? For the biopsy, do you find that kind of vascular surgeons do, do, do it more often in the like, office procedure? It's outpatient procedure, not not office, but outpatient. You know, it's usually like day day surgery. Yeah, I mean, it's it's local anesthetic, but a lot of these patients are elderly. You don't want a Joan Rivers incident, you know, in your <laughs> your ambulatory care center, you know, or your office. Yeah. So, uh, Steve, do you think about this disease as a monophasic illness or as a chronic illness that the patient will have after oh, diagnosis? That's a good question. Have? I think of it as a monophasic prolonged illness because I think that, um, I mean, the real danger for the other eye going blind is the first two months of, of pregnancy or steroid therapy. You can get them through that. I think that I, I warn people that they'll probably be on steroids for a year. You know, you look at the literature in Europe, they tend not to use it as long, but in the United States it tends to be a year longer. So it's a long haul. So I, I most people, at least in terms of the visual loss, if they're uh, appropriately tapered very slowly, it seems like it's monophasic. I'm not seeing visual loss recur. I don't know if you've seen neurological recurrence. Well, here. I mean, because this is in the spectrum with polymyalgia rheumatica. Right. Patients Frequently, yeah, are maintained yeah. on tiny doses of steroids for years. And if they yes. Off, they have a jump in their set rate and they get sick again. Yeah. Uh, and they may develop a, you know, giant cell arthritis at any point. That's right. I've seen those cases who say they've had PMR and they're just on small 5 milligrams of prednisone, you know, and set rates down. Right. And then this occurs, you know. So it's an interesting relationship. So. I don't know exactly. I think it. I do know it's it's very unusual for people to present uh, later than about six weeks with uh, the other eye going once they're appropriately treated. That'd be highly unusual. So that's the real high risk time is that when they first present with one eye blind and you're 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 trying to calm things down. Now this is the new information, which I don't know if any of you are aware of this. But Brad Katz at the university, they're doing all this pioneer research, I'm telling you, at University of Utah. Um, they have found a potential link with an infectious organism in GCA patients. And how have they done this? Uh, it's sort of like the ulcer story. They have gotten biopsies sent, and they've analyzed it uh, with uh, markers, uh, PCR or something, for this spirochete Burkholderia pseudomalli. And they're finding it in the uh, biopsy specimens. And this is an organism that could be treated like cat scratch in a way with doxycycline, minocycline. So they're starting some clinical trials to see if we should be adding that to the steroid therapy of people with giant cell arteritis. It's kind of intriguing, you know, the idea that it might be a trigger, it might be an infection. So in these are early studies. They have been asking my colleagues to send biopsy specimens to the University of Utah so they can do the, the testing for the organism. So he'll report back to our professional society to see if this is going anywhere. I don't know. I'm not currently treating patients with antibiotics. But it's intriguing. You know, it's intriguing. Who knows? 
All right. Um, I wanted to bring you, this is very new, and it's been published uh, in April, the, the first paper. I'm the principal investigator for um, the pseudotumor trial, the, the IIH, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension treatment trial. And uh, we're following patients out to four or five years. The first six months of clinical data has been published in JAMA in April. And I'm just going to show you a few summary side, slides of it. And we're now in sort of planning phases for a surgical trial versus medical therapy. So the typical patient is a, a woman in 30s who's obese with headaches and graying out. You're, you're very familiar with this. Here's a case I just wanted to show you. Has grade 3 papilledema, pretty good visual acuity, and visual fields show enlarged blind spots with a cecocentral scotoma in the worst eye on the right. And that's sort of a typical thing you might see. And the OCT, which I do now on, on these patients because I think it's kind of helpful, even though it's in sort of an experimental phase. You can see the papilledema in the pictures, the, the red free photographs, and the, the height of the nerve fiber layer measured around the optic disc. You can see in the right eye, it's 349 micron versus 277. And normal would be about 100, 110. So these are pretty elevated. Uh, and you might see that with, you know, with, with uh, pseudopapilledema from Drusen, typically you might see a little bit of elevation. You're not going to see uh, you know, over 200 microns of elevation. So when I see people where it's a rule out papilledema versus pseudopapilledema, might be a child or, an, or a person in their 20s or 30s, the OCT is helpful to me. It breaks down when you get uh, a lot of papilledema, like grade 4 and 5, the OCT doesn't know how to measure. You can see here it's off the chart in terms of those standard deviations. Uh, it breaks down at some point, but it, it's quite useful, and you'll see how this resolves. Now, of course, you don't know if it's resolving because they're developing optic atrophy or because the papilledema is coming down, but you should be able to see if they're developing optic disc power with atrophy. So this lady had a workup with an MRI and an MRV, high opening pressure, and was started on Diamox and did very well. So this is one of my success stories, and I've had some that are not successful, unfortunately, no matter what you do. But, you know, resolution of the optic disc swelling, blind spots are almost back to normal. And here's the OCT, and you see that, uh, you know, the, the height has come down. In fact, you see it's a little subnormal, which probably means there's a little bit of atrophy going on, right, that might not even be appreciated fundoscopically. You, you probably wouldn't be able to appreciate that. So the, the trial that we did, we recruited patients at... 30-something centers across the country, uh, age 18 to 60, that met the DANDY criteria, newly diagnosed, and the, the worse eye had to have a parametric mean deviation between minus 2 and minus 7. That's a mild to moderate visual loss in the worse eye. It's not considered severe. We didn't feel ethically that it would be safe to put the, the more advanced patients into a randomized treatment trial. And the two arms of the trial, out of 165 patients, everybody got treated with a, a low-sodium diet with weight reduction program from Columbia University. Half the patients received placebo, half received uh, cetazolamide in varying doses, up to 4,000 milligrams a day. But you're going to say that's a lot of Diamox. But um, that's true. But 40% of the patients in the trial sustained uh, 4,000 milligrams of cetazolamide a day. And we were told to try and get them to take as much as they would tolerate. I didn't have anybody get up to that high. We had four men and 161 women in the trial, and the mean BMI was almost 40. And some had family members with IIH, which I think is interesting. So if you look at the results of the trial, I'll show you a couple of the summary of these. So there was a treatment effect. of Cetazolamide did better than diet alone in terms of the improvement in the visual field. It wasn't a huge effect, though. In all of them, you see it's only a 0.71 decibel improvement in the visual field. That's not huge. It's statistically significant. But if you, if you take out, I'll show you in a second, if you take the worst patients, they do have a more impressive improvement. If you look at the papilledema, what you see, the pattern here, is diet works. But look how diet works. Look at the curve at, at months one through six. I can find my pointer. 
But if you look at the curve, you see that every month it goes down slowly in a linear pattern. Whereas if you add acetazolamide, it's a rapid drop in the first two months, which is then sustained. So there's a, a bonus to doing the acetazolamide with diet, the combo. They both work ultimately, but you may take longer to get there with diet alone. If you look at the worst grade patients, grades three through five of papilledema, and these, these all had fundus photographs that were independently analyzed at a reading center, you see that there is a more significant improvement in the visual field at 2.27 decibels from placebo, rather than that one I showed you, which was like 0.67 improvement. It's a more substantial improvement in the visual field. This is every day. <laughs> no. Steve, please repeat the question. Uh, no, it, it, is this all high dose? No, this is everybody. These are the results, but we pulled out the patients who presented with the worst grades of papilledema as a subgroup. And you see there's a more profound effect. This is all doses. I don't have it broken down by doses. Um, when you look at weight loss and you look at the, at the diet alone versus the addition of cetazolamide, you see about twice the weight loss, roughly 8 pounds versus 16 pounds in six months. Target weight loss was 6 percent. Uh, goal with the weight counselors. We tried to target, try to get to 6% in six months, which is considered an aggressive weight loss, according to the weight center at Columbia. When you looked at spinal fluid, now we didn't have everybody agree to doing a second spinal tap at six months, but uh, we had a pretty good uh, agreement of folks who did. Over half the patients got a second spinal tap. And you see a, a more significant drop of the CSF opening pressure in people who were treated with diet plus acetazolamide, almost twice the lowering of the CSF pressure with the combination. And we think that this is pretty good objective proof that, that diamox, acetazolamide, really does lower CSF pressure. That's the mechanism. Um, and it turns out that, the, uh, that these effects really are independent of weight loss. So in the, in the acetazolamide-treated group, you see improvement whether or not patients were able to successfully lose weight. Uh, the combination was best when they did both. They had a more rapid improvement in all parameters, but uh, many patients did not lose weight and still did well with uh, acetazolamide therapy. And we had a similar number of dropouts uh, in the two arms in terms of side effects from medication. So the conclusions from the study were that the addition of acetazolamide to weight loss from diet and exercise you know, has a significant improvement in field, the grade of papilledema, and also we did quality of life measures. People felt better who were also on acetazolamide with diet and lowering of the CSF opening pressure. And the conclusion from the authors who, who wrote the paper was that you should sort of use maximally tolerated dosage of acetazolamide. I don't personally do that. I have a pretty good sense. It depends on the severity of the visual loss. If they come in with a fairly significant, I'll be more aggressive about a typical starting dose would be 500 milligrams twice a day or 1,000 at bedtime. And I, I might get people up to 2,000, 2,500. I, I really go over 3,000 a day uh, occasionally. You know, and I tell people they're going to have tingling, they're going to have some of the symptoms from the diamox, and they should just anticipate that. But you see, I was shocked that 40% of the patients tolerated 4,000 milligrams a day at six months were taking that much. So that's quite surprising to me. And I get calls from the pharmacy all the time who say, tell the patients, you're on a toxic dose of medication. You can't take that much diamox. Even with 1,000, they'll tell the patient, your doctor's giving you a toxic amount of medication. That's way more than you should be taking. Well, you know, that's like the standard dose. And I get referred patients from neurologists who have 250 milligrams at bedtime as a starting dose, which I think is way underdosed. So 1,000 is reasonable. You started right away on 500? Wait, wait, wait. What? You started right away on 500 twice a day? Yes. I often, I even, do I start them right away? Yes. And I often do it even if I do the lumbar puncture when I'm, I'm certain that this is what's going on, because it's not really going to affect the opening pressure that much, honestly. So, yes? Have you ever tried to pyramate, which is also a good yes. carbonic anhydrase inhibitor? I've done it a number of times with the headache complaints 
were at least as prominent as the visual loss headaches, it works extremely yeah. well. I've had success up. with it as well. It hasn't been tested, but I agree. I've had patients who do not tolerate Diamox. Most people who say they, they can't take Diamox because they have a self-allergy, we've shown that's not true. That, that it's actually not really a sulfa drug per se, and they usually don't have an allergic reaction to acetazolamide. But I have used tofiramate very successfully uh, in, in larger doses, and uh, it has worked very nicely. And sometimes I've used it in combination. When people don't tolerate increasing diamox, I, I've added tofiramate. And my colleagues have done the same. Uh, Steve, yes. uh, the German urology article was very, very nice. Uh, uh, I wondered, and I couldn't tell from reading it, uh, if there were any patients uh, that had normal body weight uh, and fit the criteria for the study. Mm. In other words, does that rule out a diagnosis of intracranial hypertension? No, and I've had several patients. I have current, I have patients now. Do they have to have a BMI, uh, you know, to have pseudotumor? Right, a high BMI, they say 30 or higher. Uh, I don't think so because I've had several patients. I've had people who are size four, you know, woman. I've had several that have. I've done MMRV. I've done everything looking for other causes, and I have found no other cause. And they otherwise meet all the criteria. It's unusual, and I always do an MRV in those cases. In those cases, but I, I think that's possible. Can you tell us why? <laughs> it was not vitamin A toxicity because one of the things we've done, we don't know why people get this disease. We, we have actually looked at vitamin A levels in the CSF and that did not, very early, we knew that that was not a significant uh, risk factor for pseudotumor. So it's not vitamin A. We're doing uh, genetic uh, SNPs on these patients, so they're looking for gene analysis to see if there's some genetic predisposition. That'll be interesting to see. There'll be there'll be a, a, a many many papers coming out from this trial uh, that will be published on different things, quality of life and weight loss issues, and, and quite a few different things that will come out of this. Risk factors, and that sort of thing. Demographic analysis. Yes. Yeah, there were, I don't show you the treatment failure, so I didn't show that slide because of time, but in the full talk I have it, and there were people pulled as treatment failures because the diet group especially only, people who advanced uh, despite diet only, we didn't feel it was ethical to allow them to stay in, so we pulled them out, and, um, and so they were open label at that point. They've been followed, but they were pulled out of the study. Okay, I'm going to keep going so we can get through. Um, I've talked about this a bit before, so I'm going to go a little bit more quickly through the MS and use of OCT, but I wanted just to emphasize a couple of things for the residents, new things in terms of what has been added to our use of OCT over what I've talked about before. So of all these ways we can assess optimal function, the two that we, call, uh, we, we think are quite important now are, are low contrast visual acuity testing and OCT, optical coherence tomography. The contrast sensitivity is, is highly impaired in patients who've had a history of optic neuritis, perhaps permanently in, in at least a third of the patients. Um, these are some of the charts. On the left, you see the standard 100% contrast chart, which is Snellen charts very poorly designed for multiple reasons. Uh, you see there's a different number of letters on every line. They're, they're, they're not spaced even, you know, the same on every line. The spacing is different. There's a lot of inherent uh, problems with the old eye charts, if you haven't learned that. And so when we do uh, clinical trials, we use ETDRS charts, which were for diabetic retinopathy testing, and those all have equal spacing, five letters per line, and they're much better uh, indicators of visual function. We've taken the ETDRS chart, and over here you see a, a, a low contrast version of that. So um, I typically use 2.5% contrast, and it's a very sensitive indicator of visual dysfunction in people with MS or, or optic neuritis. And I've had quite a few people who have patients with MS with normal 20-20 acuity with 100% contrast, and you do this and they can't see any letters on the low contrast chart. They completely flunk the chart, and they will tell you that they, they do not feel safe driving, 
they have a great deal of problems reading and low lighting. You know, and, and, and finally they have an explanation where I can share with them of why they're having problems. You know. So it's very helpful. We do an MSI clinic uh, a couple of half days a week where we, we put patients through low contrast testing like once a year. We do the OCT on their optic nerves. So low contrast acuity is very important. Um, this is just showing you kind of what we're doing with the OCT. If you look at the retina inside out, these are the photoreceptors. The superficial layer of the retina is the axons, the naked axons of the, of the ganglion cells, right, that form the optic nerve. So now we can segment the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is here, the naked axons, and we can now segment. The new thing is we can segment the ganglion cell layer. And that's quite exciting. Uh, we have the, here's a nice uh, color photograph histology showing the nerve fiber layer at the top and then the ganglion cells and how we can now separate those two out. And it shows some very interesting things with uh, MS patients. So you get a patient like this with OCT. Uh, that's a normal OCT and it, it's printed out like this where you see these clock faces with quadrants and within two standard deviations it will be green if it's outside of that it drops into yellow and then if it's beyond one percent likelihood of being normal it's into a red zone where they're spinning and we run people through and you see people with optic neuritis typically get temporal is the most common quadrant we see we see temporal thinning like in that eye in the left eye Whereas with ischemic optic neuropathy, you'd see superior inferior quadrant involvement with OCT. So we do it for those patients too. But you can't do it acutely. You have to wait three or four months to see this show up because it takes time for the nerve fiber layer atrophy and dropout to occur. And the chronic MS patients, you see this kind of picture where the averages are, are pretty low, 58, 70 microns. And Fiona Costello at Calgary has shown if you drop below 75, patients know it. They have subjective visual blurring that is pretty persistent. And there's a strong correlation of visual field dropout below 75 microns. It becomes a linear downturn for the visual fields. So RNFL has been very helpful. We see it in patients after they recover from optic neuritis. We see accelerated dropout in MS patients even without, without a history of optic neuritis. So, and we see it in the contralateral eye, people who say they have optic neuritis one eye, but we see there's thinning going on in the opposite eye. Here's Fiona's paper. You can see, if you're looking at the RNFL, normal being around 100 to 110, the visual field correlation, the visual field holds pretty good until you get to around 75, and then there's kind of a linear drop-off where you start seeing significant impairment in the visual fields of these patients. And so I've used that as kind of a marker for a patient. They ask me, what do the numbers mean? I say, well, if you're above 75, that's pretty good. But if we get, I've had people say, what's the lowest you've ever seen? Do you have any idea what the lowest number you could have in terms of an RNFL for an optic nerve with atrophy is? It won't be zero. You can't go to zero. About 35, probably the lowest they would get, 35. But that's pretty wiped out optic nerve, severe blindness. So, so that's the story, and we see an accelerated dropout. You know, in, in a normal aging patient, we see a decrease of about 0.2 microns per year in the average. And the limited studies that have been done on MS patients over five years show about a two micron drop. So, ten time, tenfold increase somewhat similar to what you see with brain atrophy in normal patients versus some MS patients have accelerated brain atrophy. So there's an interesting, perhaps there's an interesting correlation there. The latest thing that we've added that you don't know about that I haven't talked about is we now have the segmentation for the ganglion cell uh, layer. And this has been shown in two or three papers that have come out recently to be possibly superior to the RNFL as a marker of axonal loss. So we started doing it, and I want to show you what that looks like. So if you go off the optic nerve here, you see the target is now on the macula, not on the nerve. And we, we break it down into six segments rather than four quadrants. But it's the same idea, which is essentially green is within normal range, yellow being borderline. 
and red showing significant dropout of the ganglion cell layer. So the mechanism is not completely understood. It's this retrograde dying off of ganglion cells you know, versus a, a direct effect of the MS on ganglion cells. We don't know. But you see how this patient with optic neuritis has wiped out the GCL in the right eye and it's completely normal on the left eye. And I see these changes occurring before we see thinning on the other, on the retinal nerve fiber layer. It precedes that. So this is one study that shows that, uh, you know, if you look at this, there's a more significant, it's a correlation that's better than the traditional RNFL with disability status, low contrast vision, than the, than the RNFL measurements. Um, and it may also correlate, this one study showed a higher uh, incidence of relapses with MS and brain lesions, new brain lesions in patients with accelerated thinning of the ganglion cell layer. So I'm doing this on all the patients now. We do both at the same time as we, as we see patients through. We do a combination plus low contrast acuity testing. Any questions about that? So that's just a little update. There'll be more uh, coming out about GCL. There's quite a lot of literature coming out about looking at it with OCT. And then the last topic I wanted to cover in the last few minutes is NMO and what's going on with NMO, which if you've kept up with it, it uh, used to be called Devic syndrome, but um, there's just quite a lot of fascinating things, and we didn't really know very much about it. When I was a resident, you know, people were confusing it with MS. Is it a type of MS? Is it, is it some patients had lupus as well? Does that mean, you know, is, are those two separate diseases? And patients typically have severe optic neuritis and history of transverse myelitis traditionally. The optic neuritis is said to be very painful, typically. It's, it's unusually painful and uh, severe visual loss. The myelitis, people get things like bladder involvement, they get lernites, and they often, uh, an interesting thing is refractory hiccups, probably from not spinal cord involvement, but uh, higher up in the, in the brainstem, of course. And the newer, descriptions of NMO really show that it's like MS in the sense that it has relapses and recurrences and there can be years between involvement of optic nerves and the spinal cord. Um, there may be brain involvement in terms of MRI changes and they may look somewhat like MS. So here's a picture of a patient of mine who has these sort of confluent areas of, of white matter involvement that might be mistaken for MS, and there may be involvement in unusual places where there's a high concentration of aquaporin-4, uh, area postrema with the hiccups, and also around the brainstem, the, the diencephalic region. So um, this is a paper that was published from Mayo showing these sort of unusual locations for white matter and sometimes gray matter involvement with NMO. And I've had some interesting patients that I had misdiagnosed as MS, which subsequently, I, when the antibody became available, I tested and discovered they actually were NMO patients and not MS patients. And one of those patients had intractable hiccups, which subsequently has become sort of a hallmark uh, of NMO. So if you get a patient with that, with uh, optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, you should strongly consider NMO. Now these are the original criteria that the Mayo group proposed for diagnosis and you know you had to have both optic neuritis and myelitis and then two of three supportive criteria. These, these, these the longitudinal involvement of spinal cord over three or more segments or possibly a positive antibody or a brain scan that doesn't look suggestive of MS. The uh, antibody tests, as you probably know, there's a couple. There's the, the Athena test that's commercially available, and Mayo Clinic does their own. The Mayo test may have a, a greater sensitivity, so I'm starting to do more Mayo Clinic than Athena testing on these. And people do sometimes seroconvert. So if it's negative once, it might change after a year, which I found in my own and now there's a spectrum they call NMO spectrum of disease. This is Wingerchuk's latest presentation at the Academy of Neurology. I don't know if some of you might have heard this. 
we had these, these unusual patients, people with just optic neuritis with severe visual loss that may not recover very well, and these unusual uh, hypothalamic cases or pres type syndrome patients that end up being NMO. So there's quite a, a spectrum of presentation. And they have uh, proposed a new set of criteria for diagnosing NMO. This is a summary. It's, it's a little bit, well, if they're antibody positive, it's quite simple. You, you have a positive NMO antibody, and you have to have one of the following, you know, optic neuritis, myelitis, the, the hiccuping with area post syndrome, brainstem syndrome, or, uh, you know, these are pretty straightforward. So you don't need to have both optic neuritis and transverse myelitis, which is kind of very helpful, because then you can start patients on therapy early before they develop these other complications. But the negative patients are a little bit more complicated. So two of the core characteristics above, which I listed there, and then you have to have, one has to be optic neuritis, myelitis or area post syndrome, it has to be disseminated in space, and MRI should not look like traditional MS. So it's a little bit more complicated. And there have been a couple of papers that have shown in patients with recurrent optic neuritis, um, you can see here, here's one patient that have a, a more severe case of, of recurrence of optic neuritis in seropositive patients. So we're, we're starting to screen patients with optic neuritis for NMO, particularly with recurrent optic neuritis who don't have MS, or severe optic neuritis. Um, this was a, a case series that my mentor at Harvard presented of three females with recurrent optic neuritis. They all had positive NMO antibody followed for up to 12 years. None of them developed transverse myelitis, but they all had profound visual loss in at least one eye. So they're thought to be now part of this NMO spectrum, and they would fit Winger Chuck's criteria. Who should you test in terms of antibody testing? Well, probably patients with transverse myelitis with MRI that's suggested. And I'm testing people with uh, severe optic neuritis, especially with poor recovery, where they're not getting the vision back uh, with IV steroids in particular, I'm testing those patients and finding some that are NMO positive. And uh, I've generally had them seen at our, either here at the University of Washington, and Annette Wundis has several NMO patients that I share with her, or the folks at Swedish too, we have quite a few. And uh, Annette is very experienced. I think she's, she really knows a lot about treating NMO, so I highly respect her, her input on that. But that's, so that's what's going on with NMO. Um, this is sort of a summary of what people are doing treatment-wise. I think we're moving towards people still tend to use steroids uh, early on with azathioprine or CELSEP, but I think a lot of people are moving to starting rituximab very early. This seems like, especially in patients who are not held by these others, uh, rituximab at the moment seems to be the more definitive therapy, although there's a, a trial now of ecrolizumab that's ongoing, and we'll see how that pans out. But um, I have many patients that have switched over that have broken through with cell sector azopyprin and gone on to rituximab. So if they break through, that's typically the next drug that's used. Um, questions about NMO? Questions about NMO? I think it's fascinating. Pathology is very interesting. We don't have time to talk about the pathology. Yes? Yeah. Uh, is there a false positive rate with NMO antibodies? Um, I don't false. think so. False, is there a false positive rate? Uh, probably not, unless it's very, you know, so they weren't doing titers for a while, and I think we're getting titers again. So very unlikely. Of course, the false negative, the sensitivity of the test is maybe at best 65% or something like that. So false negative is quite common, but the, the Mayo Clinic folks would say no, that if you have a positive antibody, it's the likelihood of false positive is very low. If, if they have, you know, clinical presentation in this spectrum, right? And I, I, I presented a case to um, Wingerchuk's associate, uh, Weinschenker, of uh, a patient who zero converted at our MS summit, and he loved the case and took it to the Academy of Neurology and presented 
and that was like one of the first cases of seroconversion. And that patient, I, I had an optic chiasmal syndrome that I treated as MS for years, but she'd had this echo episode of hiccuping. She was hospitalized for, for prolonged hiccuping, and it turns out she was antibody negative, and then she seroconverted to positive. So the test is getting better, I think. The, the antibody test is getting better. It's a very fascinating disease, I think. Good. All right. Well, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.